A young woman's life was brutally cut short, her family left grieving without answers. Karen Snyder was an 18-year-old young woman, known for her loving and caring nature, a devoted mother and a friendly face in her community. Karen's warmth and kindness left a lasting impression on everyone who knew her. Her life, however, took a tragic and unexpected turn on the evening of November 12, 1966. She was found lifeless by her husband at her home in Calumet City, Illinois. The scene was nothing short of horrific. Karen had suffered approximately 120 stab wounds to her chest, neck, shoulders, arms, legs, and head. The brutality of the attack was further evident from the bruises on her face and hands, as well as multiple fractured ribs. Despite the ferocity of the assault, her two-and-a-half-month-old baby, Paula, was left unharmed in her bassinet, a silent witness to the gruesome crime. One of the pallbearers, James Barbier, was a friend of both Karen and her husband. He had visible injuries, and this raised eyebrows among those in attendance. After the funeral, James was arrested for her demise. However, despite the arrest, he was never formally charged. Authorities remained tight-lipped about any potential motive he might have had for such a heinous act. Their silence only added to the cloud of mystery surrounding Karen's tragic demise, leaving friends and family desperate for answers and justice. With no conclusive proof tying him to the brutal crime, authorities had no choice but to release him, leaving the Snyder family and the community without closure. In December of 2022, a long, dormant investigation into Karen Snyder's slaying was unexpectedly reignited. Calumet City detectives reopened the case after receiving a phone call from a man, Kevin Seeley, inquiring about the decades-old crime. He mentioned that his grandmother, Dee, frequently spoke about the case. She suggested there were unresolved questions and lingering suspicions within the family. This caller was soon identified as a member of Karen's family. His persistence provided the spark needed to revisit the chilling events of 1966. Kevin said, I was at work one day and I was reading up on it, and I was like, all right, maybe after 57 years, some sort of technology can be used to figure out who committed the crime. A pair of Calumet City detectives driven by this newfound lead delved into the department's evidence locker. To their astonishment, they discovered that all the evidence from the original investigation had been meticulously preserved. The locker contained a wealth of critical information. It included copious amounts of blood evidence and multiple physical items recovered from the crime scene. Also, comprehensive case files detailing the investigation. Determined to utilize modern forensic technology, the detectives submitted the bloody clothing to the Illinois State Police Crime Lab for analysis. The advancements in DNA technology since the 1960s promised new avenues for identifying the perpetrator. With mounting anticipation, the detectives then traveled to Crevcore, Missouri, armed with a search warrant. Their target was 79-year-old James Barbier, a former co-worker of Karen Snyder's husband and the initial suspect from all those years ago. Despite the passage of time, Barbier had remained a figure of interest. The detectives collected a DNA sample from him, setting the stage for a potential breakthrough in the cold case. The evidence submitted for testing yielded conclusive results. Every item came back positive for James Barbier's DNA. Detectives had obtained his DNA through a buckle swab in March 2023, and the match was undeniable. After decades of uncertainty and anguish for Karen Snyder's family, they finally had a breakthrough. Although Barbier was a lead suspect from the very beginning, Barbier returned to his home in Gary, Indiana the fateful night 
where his wife was caring for their young child. His demeanor was markedly different than usual. He appeared nervous and agitated. His wife could not help but notice the cuts on his body, the blood smeared on his skin, and the stains on his clothes. Without a word of explanation, Barbier hurried inside, stripping off his bloodied garments and immediately placed them in the washing machine. The sight left his wife bewildered and uneasy, sensing that something was terribly wrong. Decades later, the Snyder family faces a bittersweet moment. The reopening of the case and the recent arrest of Barbier had rekindled their hope for justice. In April 2024, an arrest warrant was issued for James Barbier. On April 29, 2024, law enforcement officers arrived at Barbier's Missouri home. They arrested the 79-year-old former co-worker of Karen's husband. The arrest marked a significant turning point in a case that had haunted Calumet City for nearly six decades. Barbier was extradited to Illinois within three days of his arrest. At first, it seems unclear whether Barbier had secured legal representation. The arrest had brought a mix of relief and renewed grief to those who remember Karen, her tragic end, and the enduring mystery that surrounded her demise. Barbier returned to court on May 2nd, facing the gravity of the newly uncovered DNA evidence that linked him directly to one of the articles of clothing Karen was wearing at the time of her demise. The courtroom was filled with a palpable tension as the details of the decades-old case were revisited and the community awaited justice for Karen. Under the provisions of the Pre-Trial Fairness Act, the court was compelled to consider Barbier's age and medical condition when determining his pre-trial status. Consequently, the judge decided to release Barbier, albeit under strict conditions designed to ensure he remained within the reach of the law. Barbier's release, though conditional, stirred mixed reactions. The family is disappointed he will remain free at home until the trial. Karen's brother, Bill Neves, said, I cannot imagine to see him sitting there and for 57 years he was free. And my sister's been in the ground and now we gotta hopefully present a good case and make sure he pays for what he has done. Yet the legal system's obligation to balance humane considerations with the pursuit of justice meant that Barbier would not remain behind bars while awaiting trial. The conditions of his release included regular check-ins with law enforcement, surrendering his passport to prevent any attempt to flee, and a mandate to remain under house arrest with electronic monitoring. These measures aim to ensure that Barbier remained accountable and accessible to the court while addressing the concerns related to his health and age. Barbier is due back in court in Markham on May 21, 2024, for his next status hearing. Paula Larson, daughter of Karen, said, Had he had more time, or maybe been even more deranged than he actually is, again, my opinion, maybe he could have eliminated me as well. My family on my father's side had always said, this is the man. My father fought from the day he found her until the day he passed to try and bring this to justice. Paula said her mother was beautiful and that her family loved her very, very much. She received a phone call when the case was reopened. It was one of the best phone calls I have ever received. And the second best phone call was the other day, when they called to tell me that the man was in custody and arrested. I had to drive past the cemetery the other day. I was alone in the car, and I said out loud, Mom and Dad, we got him. What if an unsolved mystery from decades ago suddenly unraveled, revealing dark secrets and hidden truths? How does a community come to terms with a brutal crime after years of unanswered questions? And what happens when a confession brings new hope to a cold case? In June of 1964, 
a fisherman pulled a severed human arm from a gravel pit east of Tip City on State Route 571 in Ohio. This gruesome discovery triggered an intensive search to locate the rest of the remains. Efforts to drain the gravel pit proved futile, leaving investigators desperate for leads. Four days later, another fisherman made a chilling discovery. A burlap bag was found in a channel of the old Miami Erie Canal. It contained a dismembered human torso. The puzzle was further pieced together when a head and a leg were found in the canal. The remains were identified as 43-year-old Daisy Evelyn Shelton, a mother of Dayton, Ohio. Daisy lived off Springfield Street and worked at Delco, an automotive electronics corporation. According to a missing persons report filed by Daisy's daughter, Rita, she was last seen in late August 1963. Daisy reportedly left the house that evening, telling her daughter that she would soon return home, but she never came home. Daisy was known for providing for those around her and was regarded as a helpful person among her family. Her life had been brutally cut short and the circumstances of her demise sent shockwaves through the community. Despite the initial fervor of the investigation, leads quickly dried up and the case grew cold. Decades passed without resolution until 2017 when an unexpected break in the case emerged. In a twist that could only be described as fate, a man, fearing he was near his end in a hospital bed, made a startling confession to a nurse. He claimed to have witnessed the slaying of Daisy Shelton. His fear of imminent demise had compelled him to unburden his conscience, revealing secrets long buried by time. Miraculously, the man survived, and detectives, seizing the opportunity, conducted a series of interviews with him. The witness, whose identity remained confidential for his protection, recounted a harrowing tale. He described the events leading up to Daisy's slaying by painting a vivid picture of a crime that had haunted him for over half a century. His testimony provided critical details that had eluded investigators in 1964, shedding new light on a case that had long seemed unsolvable. The witness recounted that he saw an individual take her life by striking her on the head with a hammer at a home on Springfield Street in Dayton. The brutality of the act left a mark on the witness, who described the scene in grim detail. After the initial blow, Daisy Shelton was dismembered in the home by two more men. Her body parts were then discarded in various bodies of water in and around Tip City. Effectively, scattering the evidence made the investigation more challenging for the authorities at the time. Only the person who used the hammer was named as a suspect. He was cooperative with detectives and agreed to multiple interviews. At first, he vehemently denied knowing Daisy Shelton, despite the fact that they lived on the same street and worked for the same employer. In an interview conducted in August of 2017, the suspect's facade began to crack. Reluctantly, he admitted to knowing Daisy, a significant breakthrough in the investigation. As the interviews progressed, detectives meticulously pieced together the suspect's movements and interactions with Daisy. They discovered inconsistencies in his statements and unexplained gaps in his alibi for the time of Daisy's slaying. The pressure mounted as forensic evidence combined with the witness's detailed account painted an increasingly damning picture of the suspect's involvement. Detectives explored the possibility of personal vendettas, financial disputes, and other motives that could have led to her brutal slaying. To build a comprehensive case, detectives turned to modern forensic techniques. They re-examined the burlap bag and other physical evidence, hoping to find DNA traces or fingerprints that could irrefutably link the suspect to the crime. 
Advances in forensic science allowed them to analyze the evidence with a precision that was unimaginable in 1964. Simultaneously, the community's response to the reopened case was mixed. For some, the resurfacing of such a horrific crime brought back painful memories, while for others, it reignited a long-dormant hope for justice. Media coverage of the case intensified, with many in Dayton and Tip City following the developments closely. The suspect himself brought up the topic of a box voluntarily, suggesting he could explain why his DNA might be found on it. He claimed it was all a setup, orchestrated by the eyewitness to implicate him. Despite his attempt to deflect suspicion, he admitted that the box had indeed been in his home on Springfield Street. The suspect conceded that a box from his house had been used to carry Daisy's body parts. This admission was a critical breakthrough. The suspect further admitted that it was possible Daisy had lost her life in his home. This was a significant shift from his previous answers, aligning more closely with the witness's account. These admissions, combined with the forensic evidence, strengthened the case against him. The suspect confessed that he looked guilty and could possibly be convicted in court. He admitted that the mounting evidence, his connection to the box, the location of the slaying, and his relationship with Daisy painted a damning picture. Despite his claims of being framed, his own statements had inadvertently solidified his status as the prime suspect in Daisy's case. Detectives continued to build their case, piecing together the timeline of events leading up to Daisy's demise. They scrutinized the suspect's background, seeking any history of violent behavior or other potential motives. In light of the new evidence and the suspect's partial confessions, the case against him grew stronger. The prosecution prepared to present a comprehensive narrative that would encompass the witness's testimony, forensic findings, and the suspect's own incriminating statements. The goal was to provide a clear and convincing argument that would lead to a conviction and finally bring justice to Daisy Shelton. The witness testified at a grand jury hearing, but lost his life before the suspect could be prosecuted. The suspect, who was not named, passed away in September 2022 at the age of 92. Despite his demise, the grand jury hearing provided crucial insights into the case. They revealed the depth of the investigation and the compelling evidence gathered against him. The suspect's testimony and the findings were meticulously documented, ensuring that Daisy Shelton's story would not fade into obscurity. Law enforcement officials and legal experts analyzed the suspect's testimony and the accumulated evidence. They strived to piece together a comprehensive account of the crime. The courage of the eyewitness, who broke his silence after so many years, was instrumental in reigniting the case. His detailed confession, alongside the suspect's reluctant admissions, solidified the narrative of Daisy Shelton's tragic end. Although the suspect's demise precluded a formal trial, the investigation's transparency brought some solace to the community. Public statements from detectives affirmed that every effort had been made to uncover the truth and bring justice to light. Finally, after 60 years, on March 29, 2024, the Miami County Sheriff's Office announced that Prosecutor Anthony Kendall determined Daisy Shelton's case was solved. They decided this due to the confession from the suspect, who has now passed away, as well as other evidence. Daisy's granddaughter, Maria Walling, said that her father, Rodney, also passed away before learning what happened to his mom. Maria said, They never found the Slayer when they found all the body parts, and it really messed him up. She knows the names of the men involved in her grandmother's slaying, but deputies will not release them. I am like, finally, they found the perpetrators. There were three. 
I am going to feel bad for the families who are going to find out about how they took my grandmother's life. And while the family has answers to who was responsible for taking the life of Daisy, police have yet to confirm a motive. The case of Daisy Shelton may never see a courtroom verdict, but the relentless pursuit of truth and justice brought by modern forensics and the bravery of an eyewitness have ensured her story is no longer lost to time. Have you ever wondered how a routine jog on a serene morning could turn into a nightmare that haunts a community for over four decades? Tammy Sue Aldridge was a vibrant 20-year-old college student. She was widely recognized for her infectious smile and her passion for jogging. Tammy's life epitomized the innocence and promise of youth, filled with dreams and ambitions for the future. Her dedication to fitness was well known among her friends and family. They often saw her running through the neighborhood with an unwavering sense of joy and determination. On June 30th, 1979, Tammy was abducted while out on a jog near Jim Barnwell Road in Burlington, North Carolina. The serene tree-lined path that Tammy had traversed countless times had turned into the setting of a horrifying crime. Her sudden disappearance sparked an immediate and intensive search by local law enforcement and concerned community members. But hope quickly turned to dread as the hours passed with no sign of Tammy. In a chilling twist, the day after she was kidnapped, Tammy managed to make a phone call home. Her voice, though filled with fear, brought a momentary sense of relief to her family. She was able to call home once more the following day, her tone laced with a haunting mixture of hope and desperation. Investigator Dan Denton said that she told her family she was okay and that she would hopefully be coming home. Her family clung to the faint hope that these calls meant she was still alive and might be rescued. Law enforcement agencies intensified their efforts, coordinating a widespread search and investigation. The agony of not knowing her fate weighed heavily on her loved ones. The community rallied together, united in their determination to find Tammy and bring her home safely. Unfortunately, this brief, heart-wrenching contact would be the last time anyone heard from Tammy before her tragic end. She was found on July 3rd. Her body lay in the middle of Highway 54, a haunting sight that would forever scar the memory of those who discovered her. Tammy's ankles were bound, and burn marks indicated that a rope had been tied around her hands and neck. Her shorts were on backward and her shirt upside down indicating her clothes had been put on after her demise. The brutality of her final moments was evident. She had been assaulted. When she was found, her body was still warm, indicating she had been alive until shortly before her discovery. An autopsy determined she lost her life due to strangulation. The gruesome details of the slaying shocked the community and left her family in a state of profound grief and horror. Despite the intense investigation that followed, a suspect was never charged or arrested in Tammy's case. The lack of leads and concrete evidence left the case cold. As the years turned into decades, the hope of finding her perpetrator seemed to fade. In August 2007, police officers from North Carolina traveled to a Whiteford Township cemetery to exhume the remains of a man suspected to be the perpetrator. DNA samples were taken from the remains of Larry Chapel, who passed away in 1989 at age 51. Chapel, who lived in that part of North Carolina at the time, was considered a suspect, but there was insufficient evidence at the time to charge him. The DNA samples did not match to those taken from Tammy's body. The case, again, went cold. In 2021, however, the agency decided to revisit the case. 
They were driven by advances in forensic technology and a renewed determination to bring closure to Tammy's family. New techniques in DNA analysis and evidence processing had the potential to uncover clues that had previously been undetectable. Investigators hoped that these advancements might finally reveal the identity of Tammy's perpetrator and close the case for good. The reinvestigation brought a renewed sense of hope and urgency. A new investigator started looking through old files. Sheriff Terry Johnson said, This man was able to find a name that no one had seen in the file, just one piece of paper with a name. Sergeant Dan Denton then reopened the case. He said, Finding this name was the biggest thing, you know, once you get a name, once you get a lead, once you get something to go on that is kind of what drives you to keep digging and digging and digging. On Thursday, April 4th, 2024, the Alamance County Sheriff's Office made a pivotal announcement. Tammy Sue Aldridge's life was taken by Gary Lane LaFramboy. LaFramboy, who passed away in 2020, was revealed to be the likely perpetrator of the horrific crime. He was around 19 years old at the time of Tammy's demise. He lived in Graham, a small town a few miles from where Tammy's body was discovered. His proximity to the crime scene and his criminal history painted a disturbing picture. Just three months after Tammy's demise, LaFramboy was arrested for an unrelated kidnapping and impersonating an officer. While in custody, he also committed a serious assault on a detention officer, further solidifying his violent tendencies. He served time in prison from 1980 to 1982. LaFramboy was identified as a potential suspect through DNA evidence years before, but investigators faced a significant hurdle. They had to contact the LaFramboy's family, ultimately obtaining a DNA sample from LaFramboy's daughter. The comparison of her DNA to the evidence collected from Tammy Sue Aldridge's body yielded a conclusive match. The development was a critical piece of evidence that confirmed LaFramboise's involvement in the crime. Sheriff Johnson said the following during an emotional press conference. I hope that this development and what has happened here will give the family a little bit of closure. Tammy's family members are glad that the case is closed, but still have questions. Her uncle said, we want to thank you for what you have done. Closure is going to be different for each one of us. Your work does mean a lot to us. Thank you.